24, Proverbs chapter 24, a message entitled, uh, The Ring Buoy, as we come to Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, uh, we come to a day that is set aside for us to uh, consider that of life. As I mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy during our prayer time, uh, scripture acknowledges that there is life, there is death, there are blessings, there are cursings, and we come to an option of choosing life. Um, we bring that many times to that of abortion settings, abortion-minded individuals. Um, we also bring that to those individuals that uh, might be elderly. Um, years ago, we had a Dr. Kevorkian that came on the scene to assist people that were ready to die in health needs and great crises and of course eventually a trial came to acknowledge his guilt uh, but on the other hand many families just ready to see life change at that moment and so what does the scripture say about choosing life well if deuteronomy says we need to choose life is that it are we just in the Old Testament law, the second setting of Moses, as he is preparing to um, pass on and, and pass the torch to Joshua, or are there other words of wisdom? So we come to Proverbs chapter 24. If you're able and willing, if you stand with me for reading God's word, Proverbs chapter 24. We'll begin reading with verse 11 here in just a moment. A message entitled "The Ring." Bowie. King James Version, verse number 11. The Bible says, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that plundereth the heart consider it? He that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man According to his works. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. I rarely do this, but for my sake and maybe for yours, the King James Version uh, in Solomon's translation, the writing is, is maybe not as clear as I would prefer it for the message today. So um, I have taken the Christian Standard Bible, put the verses on the screen, and I would like to. Read that as well, um, another translation, to maybe give us a little bit of a clearer viewpoint. Um, here's what the Christian Standard Bible says. Rescue those being taken off to death, and save those stumbling towards slaughter. If you say, well, we do not know about this, won't he who weighs hearts consider it? Won't he protect your life now? Won't he repay a person according to his work? The ring buoy. Um, as I was preparing for this, I came to the office Thursday morning, and looking for my opening illustration, I came to the ring buoy. Um, we call it a life preserver, by the way. Um, it was really named after a guy by the name of Kisby. It is acknowledged as Thomas Kibbe, Kisby and the Kisby buoy. It was in the early 1800s that um, life-saving devices similar to this um, were real. And as a matter of fact, it came to the fact that they wanted to put them on ships. Now, to us today, we think that'd be pretty much common sense. Every ship should have life preservers. Every boat should have life jackets or life preservers. And um, in the mid-1800s, about 1850, it was denied putting life preservers, or the Kisby buoy, on ships. Now, <laughs> duh. Um, and so, fortunately, we won't live in 1850, or we would have just voted for it, because we're smart enough to realize that. It was 1854 that Thomas Kisby came up with this ring buoy, and he, he was a lieutenant commander in the British Naval Fleet. And as he came up with this, he created uh, were put together about a thousand of these. And he started passing them out to his Navy men, and these guys started realizing this will save us 
for men jumping overboard to try to go get other people and to try to save them and somebody ends up dying and maybe there's a man trying to save somebody's life and so finally in 1854 the British Royal Navy said we're going to put these things on every vessel we have and it was a year later in 1855 that another commander of the British naval fleet uh, came to a realization that you know what it'd be pretty cool if we had belts that were flotation devices which eventually became the life jackets. Now, in preparation for this, I acknowledged all this. In preparing for this, um, I always like to ask my daughters questions. So I asked one of my daughters a question, what branch of the military guy do you think he was that invented this? And the answer was Marines. Why would a Marine on land invent something to save people on water? And so, welcome to my world of trying to educate my children. A Navy guy invents the Kisby buoy. Why do I go through all that? Well, we know what this is for. It's pretty simple. You toss it out in the water, person grabs hold of it, and if they stay on it or stay connected to it, they won't drown. At least that's the theory of the Kisby buoy. With that mentality, with this buoy, if you will check out scripture with me and Solomon's words of wisdom as we go through these two verses, notice with me in verse 11, the failure to rescue. People were being led to death, others ready to be slain, stumbling towards slaughter. If we knew someone was getting ready to die, would we try to save them? I think we would. If we knew someone had COVID, would we take them to the hospital? If we knew someone was sick, would we try to get them treatment? If we saw someone that was getting ready to load a gun the wrong way and it might kill them, would we help them? If, if we saw something that we could prevent, would we prevent it? Well, I hope the obvious answer is yes. I, I hope we would just say, uh, yeah, um, we, we teach our kids not to put keys in electrical outlets. At least I hope we do. We try to baby-proof the house. We, we take the keys away from them. We discipline them properly. If that's a belt across their hand or their backside, don't put a key in an electrical outlet. We, we really, and here's what electricians do. They pull out a big old metal screwdriver and they go straight up to an electrical outlet to take off the cover. One slip, and they're in the outlet, just like a kid. Now I know Ray's sitting here saying, I got a little tip on my screwdriver, and I make sure the power's off, and I make sure that doesn't happen. But it's like we, we, we want to make sure we take all these safeguards, and if someone is getting ready to die, what are we doing to save them? If we're in the water, it's easy. Throw them the life preserver. Throw them the kids be buoy. Throw it out there to them. Let's save them. But in life, do we really consider the abortion-minded person? Do we consider the teenager that's pregnant? Do we consider the family and the disgrace? Or do we consider the joy the life that is brought before us. And so here's Solomon's words. Are you going to let someone die? Are you going to fail to rescue somebody when you could rescue them? Say, preacher, I'd rescue them. I, I, I'd be the first one there to rescue them. I'd do it. I don't want them to die. And yet, we have people in this community that are unsaved, on their way to hell. We know them. And we say, well, I just hope the Holy Spirit can fix them, and I hope they get saved, but we're not attempting to rescue them. We're sort of keeping the buoy to ourselves. We're keeping the plan of salvation to ourselves. We're keeping the gospel message to ourselves, and we can share it with others and rescue them. The bottom line is, I think too many times in society, we're failing to rescue people spiritually. So here's what happens with Solomon. 
Here's what happens in our life. Uh, notice with me the first phrase in verse 12. Behold, we know it not. We didn't know it. Here's the first reasoning that comes upon us. Well, I didn't know they were unsaved. They went to church when they were a kid, and I thought they might be saved. Well, the Bible says I shouldn't judge them, but I know that by their fruit, they don't appear to be a Christian, but I, maybe they are because I know years ago, um, you know, when they were four years old, that somebody told them they were saved, and, and, and but they're not living like it, and, and I, just, I just don't know, and I don't want to offend them, and I don't want to bother them. And on a spiritual level, we just keep it to ourselves and say, well, we just weren't sure. We didn't know. Really? Didn't know? Would it have hurt for you to ask? No. Do you think you're offending a Christian by asking them if they're a Christian? You can ask me if I'm a Christian anytime you want to. You're not going to offend me. Ask me if I'm a Christian. Let's talk about it. If there is someone out there and, and you're saying, well, I just didn't know if they were saved or not, so since I don't know, I'm not going to bother them, that is not the way it works. And Solomon's saying, hey, you think, well, I just didn't know. And we consider the apportioned-minded person or the person that is has an opportunity to bring light into the world, and we say, well, we just didn't know. Well, guess what? You know now there is a resource center here in Anson County that deals with this. And now since you know, you are going to be held accountable. We'll get to that. Since you know, we are to do something about it. As a church, as a ministry, we are to do something about it. We support, as a church, monthly donations to hope. We support, as a church, this annual baby drive. But is there more we can do to support life. Is there more that we can do? And the first reasoning comes out and says, well, we just, we just didn't know. And so here's Solomon. On earth, considered the wisest man in scripture, he says, oh, is that the case? You're acting like you didn't know. Well, let me, let me go ahead and fix that with my next statement. Solomon says, behold, we know it not. Whoa! Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? Let me put this in perspective. Your heart is known, your soul is known, your life is known. It's only put a fierce reality in front of you. You don't have an excuse. You and I don't have an excuse. God knows our hearts. We go back to David, and we know don't look on the outward countless of man, look on the inward. God looks at our hearts. God knows our hearts. He knows what you know. He knows what you're telling people you don't know. He knows everything about us. And because he knows everything about us, there is a fierce reality that we should have in our lives that God knows everything about us. You say, preacher, if he knows everything about us, that, that can worry me. Well, I don't want you to be worried about it. That's the last thing you should be. If you're living with the Lord, you should be thrilled that he knows what you're doing. As you're serving him, as you're living for him, as you are telling others about the gospel message, as you are choosing life, as you are sharing and rescuing people. If God knows your heart, God knows your life. There should be nothing to worry you about that if you're living for the Lord as you should. Here's who worries. Those of us not living for the Lord as we should. Those of us that January 1st said, man, I'm going to read through the Bible. And by January 17th, we missed 14 days. Or 15 days. Or I'll restart again in 2022. Um, you know, we, we, when we fail to rescue, well, I just didn't know it. Yes, you did. The fierce reality is God knows everything you know and everything about you. And the reality is you need to examine yourselves. We need to examine ourselves. And we need to come up with a reality check of saying, okay, am I failing to rescue when I could be saving someone's life? Saving someone's life. 
Thomas Kisby invented this buoy. He put out a thousand buoys. Very quickly, other people started making imitations of his. Very quickly, the imitations found out that they didn't use the same cork that he was using, and the imitations did not hold up with body weight. They would float, but they would not sustain over 40 pounds of weight holding onto it. Kisby immediately started with this reputation that all was good, and then because of some other things, it seemed like all was bad. And he literally gave up his patent to let everybody see how it was actually created properly. Now, why do I go with that? Why do I bring it up now? I want you to look at the last phrase of verse 12. And here, here's what the Bible says. He that keepeth thy soul, he knows it, and shall not he render every man according to his works. There's a final rendering. Your works are going to be judged. For Kisby, he took this ring boo, he put it together, and people were thrilled. But the fakes out there started giving a reputation on him, and he was being judged for the false things that were going on. And so he finally went out there and said, Dad, wait a minute, you're not making it correctly. You're not making out the right cork. You're not putting this together. And he gave up his patent. He gave up his money-making idea and save lives so that other people would understand how to do it the correct and right way. So for you and me, we come to this period of time to say, you know what? Um, what's my excuse? Why? Well, I didn't know about it. And God, he knows your heart, your soul, he knows your life. Um, a reality check there. You come to this rendering, and for everything I do, I'm judged. Not just by people in church to judge preachers, but by God, which, take this right, is more important than you judging me. And it's me and him. And, and when I fail, he knows it immediately. When I fail, you might know it. <laughs> you guys have been gracious and merciful to me. But you may not know it. You may not realize it. But he knows it. And it comes to my works are judged. My works are judged. Before you, before others, before God. Your works are judged. Before yourself before others. Sometimes the preacher even hears it. But, you know, it's not me. It's, it's our works are judged before God. Let me, let me go ahead and take the buoy off now. Uh, I've left it here for this, this illustration, these purposes. Um, and I'll, I'll give a shout out to Brazelton's. Um, you can have this buoy today for $72.95. Um, to my knowledge, never been used. It's a little more, um, but he's got four price tags on it. He wanted to make sure y'all knew the price of it. Um, when I went to Benji and said, listen, can I borrow this thing? Um, here's the deal with the boom. Sailors were taught when they first got this thing to take this and throw it like a frisbee. That's how they were taught. Then they came in secondly and they decided, well, we're going to throw it like this, like a discus. And, and either way, it, it was it was working, and so they would take it and, and they would they would take as best of their ability and they would toss it. There it is, and hopefully it would get to the person that they were trying to save. And there it is, and so Larry and Ray and Becca they all hop on the buoy and they and and their life is saved, but not really. They're still in the water. They're still out in the ocean. They're still stuck right there. Now, middle of the ocean, they can all three fight over what direction they want to go. Or one person out there, what direction do I go? And there was one fatal flaw in the Kisby buoy. It wasn't the design, it wasn't the rope connected to it, it wasn't the flotation device, all of that worked. The one fatal design of the Kisby buoy is that when you toss it, there's no way of getting it back. 
Now I thought about going ahead and tying a line to pull it back to me. But I want you to see this picture. Too many times we throw out hope out there and we leave it. And we never go to meet the person. We never get out there. We never pull them to us. I put a gospel message out there on YouTube and maybe somebody will get to it. I, 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 I preach a message and maybe somebody will connect to it. Well, I, I told people 12 years ago I got saved and maybe somebody will remember that. And that's not the way it works. As a matter of fact, Cindy, put this picture, last picture up there in the movie on the screen. I want you that one. Thank you, dear. You see there's a rope connected to it. There's a rope connected to it. And on the other end of that rope would be protocol. Three sailors on one rope. Three people to rescue one person. That was standard protocol when these things went into place. You know what, guys? I would hope that we would be ready to send the, the kids be buoy, the life preserver, the message of the gospel out. I really would be. But I would hope that there would be a line attached to it. And I would hope on the other end of that line there would be people like you and me ready to draw people from death to rescue them from slaughter, to convince them to choose life, and then to present the gospel message of Jesus Christ that others would have life, not just on earth, and not just more abundantly, but eternal life with Jesus Christ our Savior forever. With your heads bowed, as I go to a time of invitation this evening, Solomon says, every man according to his works. The Kisby movie saved thousands of lives. The flotation devices, the life jackets, the flotation belts, they're all there to save lives. We've got something better than that. We've got the message of Jesus Christ that saves lives forever and ever and ever. Our Heavenly Father, today I come before you. May we not be ignorant. May we not make excuses. Lord, may we understand that you know our hearts, you know our soul, you know our life. And we come to a point that we'll be judged for our works. And Lord, may our works see that we have sent out a life preserver. We've sent out the gospel message. We've done what we could to choose life. We've done what we could to see others live. And Lord, we presented the gospel of Jesus Christ that they might not only live abundantly, but they might have eternal life forever and ever and ever. Lord, help us. Convict us to continue on strong, serving you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand for our invitation?